as the reason the ICJ didn't order an Israeli ceasefire in the Palestinian genocide case is not for lack of evidence, in my opinion, but for fear that they could not yet enforce the ruling. But the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, to function, the United States, the European Union, must first stop serving as an accessory to the crime. They are literally accessories to the crime. And as long as they continuously do that, then nothing can really change. Because these world powers are continuing to keep the genocide going. They're complicit in it. And that's what's happening. So, People saying that the court did, did call for a ceasefire essentially are wrong. What the court did call for is like a referee is for Israel to stop doing illegal moves in the fighting. It's like when two boxers are boxing and the referee tells one of the boxers to stop doing an illegal move. Does the referee stop the fight? No. He just says, oh, you can't do that move. Meanwhile, the Palestinians, and of course, by extension, the Palestinian resistance, they want the, study, the fighting to stop. So the country of South Africa has taken Israel to court, court and it has charged them with committing genocide against the Palestinian people in Gaza for the last 100 days. And the ICJ has reached a ruling now, this is not a final ruling, mind you. A trial has to take place further down the line. But here's the thing. If Israel is committing a genocide, then this is one of the reasons why it is important that this takes place. Because their charge is of genocide. Now, many are celebrating the ruling as of yesterday. And this ruling is a good thing, but it's hollow in the grand scheme of things. Now, let's go over what the ruling was, and then we'll talk about why we should not be celebrating just yet. So, let me share this. And let's go over what the judge says. Now, we're going to share this from a Saul Rod. Shout out to her. So, a Saul Rod says the International Court of Justice finds that there is sufficient basis for South Africa's case against Israel and will not dismiss the case as Israel requested. This is an historic moment. The court's decision makes U.S. complicity more difficult for Biden's officials to deny. So. Let's go over this just so that we are clear. The acts and omissions capable, sorry, complained of by the applicant appear to be capable of falling within the provisions of the Genocide Convention. In the court's view, at least some of the acts and omissions alleged by South Africa to have been committed by Israel in Gaza appear to be capable of falling within the provisions of the Convention. In light of the following, the court concludes that prima facie, it has jurisdiction pursuant to Article 9 of the Convention to entertain the case. Given this conclusion, the court considers that it cannot accede to Israel's request that the case be removed from the general list. So, that's basically what is said. That South Africa has accused Israel of genocide. Israel denies it, but they want the and they want the case thrown out. The court says South Africa actually has a valid reason to accuse Israel of genocide, and they rejected Israel's request to have the case thrown out. 
So that's what happened. So how did the court rule? Now we're gonna get into that because this is also important. I want you guys to pay close attention to these rulings. So let me share the screen again. This is from uh, Suleiman Ahmed. Shout out to him. So it says breaking ICJ rulings against Israel and in favor of South Africa. And at first, in a ruling of 15 to 2, the state of Israel shall take all measures to present the commission of genocide to Gaza. And number two, 15 to 2 says the state of Israel shall ensure that the military not commit any acts of genocide. And number three, 16 to 1, Israel shall take all measures to punish all public solicitations to genocide. Now, these public solicitations, what are they? Public solicitations would be any Israeli official that talks about or advocates for genocidal acts which have been done by Israeli officials and basically saying, you guys must stop this. So, like saying, we will, like one of the, I think it was the defense minister saying the stopping, the halting of water, food, fuel, and electricity to Gaza, things like that, that is genocidal in nature, right? The request and saying things like the, like the wanting of the bombing of hospitals and of refugee camps and mosques and churches and the like. Saying that they are children of the darkness versus the children of the light, right? So this is why it is important that they bring this out too. All right, so let's continue. Number four, Israel from 16 to 1 says, Israel shall take immediate and effective measures to address adverse conditions to life in the Gaza Strip. So. When it comes to the conditions of no water or dirty water, they need to fix that. They need to allow the food and aid to come in so that the civilians are taken care of. You literally have right now people who are in medical facilities. By the way, all the hospitals are, are gone. All of them. They're gone. They have no medical care. So any type of medical care that they're giving, people who have to endure surgeries are getting surgeries without anesthesia. If you've ever been through surgery, and I have many times, just waking up and having the pain is harsh. Having to go through surgery without anesthesia is something that I wouldn't wish upon anyone. That's what they're going through. You have women that are literally giving birth without any type of anesthesia. They're doing C-sections without anesthesia. So, and then you have Israelis literally blocking the trucks from coming in. Let's continue. Fifteen to two. Israel shall take the effective measures to preserve evidence of actions impacting the genocide convention. And then number six, fifteen to two. Israel shall submit to the court a report on all measures taken to follow the orders of this court within one month. So it sounds kind of weird, right? Like it's not saying immediately, it's saying, okay, you guys got one month to do this. What? What the hell? What did you notice about those rulings? 
we're going to sum this up through one of our comrades, Richard Medhurst. He summed this up. Let's get into it. Richard Medhurst says, it is my job to translate politician into English. So let me explain what the ICJ just ruled. Israel can keep slaughtering Palestinians. Take your time and stop announcing the genocide when you speak Hebrew. Also give Palestinians some food before you shoot them back in a few years. This is why I said, do not celebrate so quickly. Because yes, while this is a, in a positive direction, Palestinians are still going to keep getting getting killed. They're still going to keep dying. Even what we have to take into consideration is was what happened in the ICJ meaningless? I don't want to say that it was meaningless because what South Africa did was very important. But we have to take things into context, right? So let me share this. This is from Ali Abu Nima from Elect Electronic Antifada. He says, a ceasefire is what you demand in an armed conflict. In a genocide, you demand in a many an immediate end to all genocidal acts. And that is exactly what the ICJ ordered with immediate effect. Please stop helping Israel spin its historic defeat as a win. He continues. Equally important to remember that ICJ ruling is not about what Israel will do. Israel will ignore any ruling. It is about forcing the West, the rest of the world to take seriously their obligations to stop an entity now officially accused of genocide by the world's highest court. So. You know, and I know that it is officially a genocide because the ICJ is like, well, you guys need to stop this because it's looking like a genocide. So now we know it is official. Yeah, it's a genocide. So I want you guys to also. See, see the method of South Africa and what they did and see it as a positive step in the right direction. It's a step. So it is not without, it is not without reaching the goal, right? What I, what South Africa did is important with what Indonesia now is doing with declaring the occupation to be illegal and saying that the occupation needs to end. That's what Indonesia is doing. They are doing something that's valid. That should be done as well. So I'm gonna share this with you as well. This actually came from TikTok and I wanna share this with you guys. This is also deep. I want to make important. it very clear that South Africa is playing. So make sure. I increase the size. All right. So listen to this person. And this gives a lot more context. I want to make it very clear that South Africa is playing a game. South Africa is playing the game. We know that the ICJ is just an arm of the UN, which is just an organization that was created to subdue certain powers uh, because some powers cannot be subdued by the UN, right? The South Africa is just playing the game as the game is meant to be played. So there was an agreement. There are international laws. 
South Africa is just trying to show us that this is what they say and this is what they do. Because it seems that the information that many people have believe is that international law is there to safeguard, right? Prevent the next world war. No, it's there to put into submission certain countries. It's there to control world power. South Africa is using the ICJ, their court system, to expose them, to show that even if you follow their rules, they will still find a way around it. And the more we are informed of this, the more we become aware, the more we begin to hold them accountable. We no longer walk around blind and ignorant to the things that are going on around the world. So yes, it may not give the verdict that we want, but it is beginning or continuing the awareness that we need as a, as a global society, not just, this is not just about one country. This is a global thing. As a global society, we need to be aware. And that is what this, this court case in the ICJ in the South, South Africa is, is, is doing. This is to me, what is most important. This is the key thing to me. So keep your eyes open, listen, be aware, stop being ignorant, learn. History is unfolding before our eyes. We hate it. We hate living through history, but this is how it happens. Keep your eyes open. Absolutely. So this explains why the ICJ did not call for a ceasefire. Remember, these rulings never stated that Israel needs to stop its offensive. Just that the killing of civilians must stop. And But we know that one, the killing of civilians won't stop. And two, the goal is not only to keep the illegal settlements, but to expand them and grow Israel beyond the present borders, aka greater Israel, which means taking out more Palestinians in the process. The resistance won't stop until the illegal occupation ends. So let me share this. And this is from Edward Snowden. Of course, Edward Snowden is considered a hero, especially for a lot of us, but here, he puts this in the context. He says, the reason the ICJ didn't order an Israeli ceasefire in the Palestinian genocide case is not for lack of evidence, in my opinion, but for fear that they could not yet enforce the ruling. But the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, to function, the United States, the European Union, must first stop serving as an accessory to the crime. They are literally accessories to the crime. And as long as they continuously do that, then nothing can really change. Because these world powers are continuing to keep the genocide going. They're complicit in it. And that's what's happening. So. People saying that the court did, did call for a ceasefire essentially are wrong. What the court did call for is like a referee is for Israel to stop doing illegal moves in the fighting. It's like when two boxers are boxing and the referee tells one of the boxers to stop doing an illegal move. Does the referee stop the fight? No. He just says, oh, you can't do that move. Meanwhile, the Palestinians, and of course, by extension, the Palestinian resistance, they want the, study, the fighting to stop, meaning a ceasefire. 
But Israel is so ambitious for the land and resources that they will keep doing illegal moves to take the Palestinians down. Why do they keep doing this? So they can get their hands on the LNG, the liquefied natural gas. They want to get that oil under Gaza and under the and, and off the coast of the West Bank. And they want to build that Ben Gurion Canal. That's what this is all about. And the US is on board for this because the corporations are on board with this. That's what they are with at to the end of the day. Now, I'm gonna share this with you guys too. Because this is also very important. An Israeli said this, and I agree. Let me share a screen. If you're Israeli or Jewish, you need to hear this. והם הבטיחו לנו שיהיה לנו וטו. מדהים, אני עד עכשיו זאת הייתה השערה שלי, עכשיו אני מתחיל <אח> להבין, עכשיו אני מתחיל להבין שזה מן המפורסמות. כן. מן המפורסמות. פרופסור שאת... משה כהן אליה לא אומר סתם דברים. בדיוק, כשאנחנו הלכנו על האג, זאת אומרת, כן. עד לכאן הגיעה השפעתם של <אח> האמריקנים, דרך כנראה רון דרמר, כי ראינו שרון דרמר הוא היה זה שהמליץ על אהרן ברק, ויכול להיות שיש לנו פה בכלל קנוניה אמריקנית, so he said it feels like it could be an American conspiracy at our expense. Well, let's continue. יכול להיות שפסק הדין הזה, או אפילו בחוות הדעת, יש לה חשיבות לאמריקנים לדיני המלחמה שלהם, לסוגיות אחרות שבהם הם עוסקים? יכול להיות? זה פסק דין שישפיע בצורה דרמטית על האמריקאים. אז אנחנו, 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 Basically meaning saying that Israel is the sacrificial lamb of the United States. I agree. Yes. Israel is the sacrificial lamb of the West. They don't care about Jews or Israelis. As long as they can keep putting their life on the line to exterminate the Arabs in the region for the West. This is why they have forced military service in Israel. Yes. It's conscription. If you are of military age and you go to live in Israel, you have to fight in the IDF. If the United States actually cared about Jews and Israelis, they would have never, they would have never sent Billions of dollars in weapons to Nazis in Ukraine. The United States does not care about Jewish people and the United States does not care about Israelis. You got to remember, there are still remnants of Operation Paperclip in Washington. They're running Washington. What was Operation Paperclip? Operation Paperclip was basically an operation that took Nazis in, in Germany and brought them here to the United States. And they put them in positions of government so that they can learn from them and how they fought in Second World War. Many fascist sympathizers are in the deep state and are running corporations that also run our government and they cannot wait to give their grubby little hands on the resources in the middle east they did it to iraq they did it to afghanistan they did it to libya and north africa they're trying to do it 
in many other different parts of the world where resources are rich. So remember this, in the end is all about money and resources. Always go back to the money. So we're gonna take another nuanced look at this, because I think this is also really important. So I'm gonna share my screen really quick. And this is from Fiorella Isabel, friend to the channel. Here she says, very nuanced. She says, I don't get why many are calling this a victory. Today, the ICJ was on trial and it proved that what many in the West, I'm sorry, many in Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, and the neo-colonized world have been saying there is no international law. Hmm. Its ruling doesn't commit to admitting that Israel is indeed committing a genocide. It simply places the burden on them to police themselves, which is a failed method, as Israel will continue to lie as they've been doing. There is no consequence placed on them, at least for a month in which they will continue killing Palestinians. No one but Israel is enforcing this. So who will enforce them and what will be the punishment? Nothing. This should have been done now, not in one month. There is a mention of releasing Israeli hostages, but what about the thousands of imprisoned Palestinians in Israeli jails? Now remember, I have actually spoken about the thousands of Palestinians that are still kept in jail, a lot of them are kept in without trial, without charge, simply because they're Palestinian. By the way, 20% of Israel consists of Arabs. Over half of the population in their prisons are Arab. What does that remind you of? Let's continue. The ruling proved that the only salvation for Palestinians is the access of resistance. International law is far too cowardly to act according to the necessary conditions. It is such conditions which should force Israel to cease all military attacks, leave occupied areas, and be sanctioned until they do so. Conditions that fail to make Palestine as, as a state but continue to call the Israeli Project One. I am not surprised Western voices hail this as a feel-good victory for which they can pat themselves on the back. But it is not this. In one month, Israel has never respected any law. A Zionist occupation project will continue killing thousands more. In one month, Palestinians will continue dying. In one month, there will be, still be a genocide because Israel has received the equivalent of a slap on the wrist. Today, the ICJ proved international law is but a feel-good Western virtue signal, as the brutal reality for Palestinians is their own, as the brutal reality for Palestinians is their own people and own resistance is the only thing that will liberate them. Children and families blown to pieces don't give a damn about how good Westerners feel about this so-called advance. Good for who? Not for Palestinians. They'll continue fighting as will the resistance with or without the veneer of international law, which so happens to only function for those in North America, Europe, the UK, or their chosen proxies. Not for the nations that have been occupied, exploited and vilified by Western imperialism. Glad y'all feel good, but to Palestinian families dying every day, this matters little. They already knew this. It is you who needs to grasp reality. Now, she continues. She says, I will add that this is historic and I'm thankful for South Africa's actions and the actions of those who followed suit. They did put both Israel and the ICJ on trial. Israel has failed, but not entirely. The ICJ has failed to do what needs to be done, even if the intent was good. Diplomacy can only go so far when the the only political and dis, political and distant from the ground reality those in Gaza are experiencing. 
It's easy to hail this as a victory when you're far from war. Is this a ceasefire? No. Is this on Israel's time? Yes. Will more Palestinians die? Yes. I don't consider that a victory, but a failure of international law to meet the emergency demands of the moment. I can tell Israel to immediately stop killing Palestinians and investigate themselves. The same way I can tell crooked cops to stop killing people and investigate themselves. The same way I can tell a bank robber to stop robbing banks and jail themselves. The same way I can tell a psych psychopathic killer to stop killing and imprison themselves. That's not a ceasefire. It is not enforceable. For the record, I am not giving Israel a victory, but I certainly am I'm not giving the ICJ one either. Palestinians also don't get a victory. The only victory I am giving is to one of South Africa and others for taking the pioneering action to try to do the right thing. So that's what the thing is. This is why I say we cannot be sitting here celebrating like this yet. Even the African foreign minister expressed disappointment. So this is straight from them. Let's share this. Uh, I believe that uh, in exercising uh, the uh, order, there would have to be a ceasefire. Without it, the order uh, doesn't actually work. I, I, I would have wanted a ceasefire. No, they didn't. But how? They didn't specify that. I have no way that I'm going to say I'm disappointed. I hoped for it, but the fact of delivering humanitarian aid the fact of taking measures that reduce the levels of harm against persons who have no role in what Israel uh, is combating, for me, requires a ceasefire. And I believe Israel would have to attend to how it conducts its search for the hostages and for those Hamas individuals who carried out the October 7th. Uh, attack. Um, I believe that uh, in exercising uh, the uh, order, there would have to be a ceasefire. With so, according to her, there is no call for ceasefire. She's literally one of the foreign ministers that led the charge against Israel. They don't want a ceasefire and they want to, the war crimes to continue. How do we know? Well, let's take a look. He is a journalist. You guys have probably said, saw this before. Calling for more war crimes. So he's calling for more the bombing of more buildings, more houses in Gaza. He says he doesn't care. They're blatant in their advocacy for war crimes. This is what a lot of them feel. I'm not going to say all because... I don't want to be general. I don't want to generalize. But a lot of them feel this way. This is what Zionism is.
Is it sick? Yes. It's depraved, in my opinion. What power does a court have if it can't enforce the law? It can't sanction Israel. It can't force them to stop. This proves that the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and the United States Nations do not have any real true power. It's not a governing power that can be neutral arbiter of justice and order. They merely symbols that are controlled by the West to manipulate us into thinking that such an institution exists. The only real justice we in the exploited class have is resistance. And I'll share this as well. Shout out to Nuno Marquez. Says the ICJ has proven international law is a joke. Shame. That's what a lot of them are saying now. Like what good is international law if you can't enforce international law? Now, there was a reply by the Defense Minister of Israel, Yoav Gallant. And we're going to read that. Yoav Gallant says, the state of Israel does not need moral preaching to separate terrorism from the civilian population in Gaza. The International Court of Justice in The Hague went above and beyond when it granted South Africa's anti-Semitic request to discuss the claim of genocide in Gaza and added sin to crime when it did not reject the petition outright. So basically what he's saying is that even though we committed genocide, we didn't want South Africa to charge us with it. And in doing so, they consider taking them to court based on the 25,000 people that are now killed in Gaza to be genocide, they consider charging that as anti-Semitic. They're really using that line. When the 25,000 people are murdered, over half of which are children. The monster continues. He says, whoever is looking for justice will not find it in the leather chairs in The Hague, but in the Hamas tunnels in Gaza where our 136 abductees are kept and those who murdered our children are hiding. By the way, if he's talking about actual children, the only child that was real actually killed on October 7th was a baby and they were killed by Israeli fire. but he won't tell you that. Those who are looking for justice will not find any operating instructions found in the pockets of the Nova terrorists who were instructed to, quote, drink the blood of the you-know-who, but in the spirit of the IDF document found in the pockets of our fighters working to protect human dignity. Human dignity, you say? 25,000, I see 25,000 reasons to not believe that. It says the state of Israel will not forget October 7th. And Palestinians have still haven't forgotten 1948, 1967, 2008, 2014, 2023, 2024. They still have not forgot October 8th, October 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th. They have not forgotten the 10,000 plus children that were massacred by their hand. 
They still have not forgotten that. Says the IDF and the security agencies will continue to act and dismantle the Hamas regime, eliminate the military capabilities, and bring about the return of the abductees to their homes. Trust the commanders of the IDF and all the soldiers who are members of the security forces. So this, this is the monster who also asked and made sure that anybody who is in Palestine has no food water, fuel, or electricity. So all the people that are dying right now are by this guy's hand. Him and Netanyahu. These are who they are. They're monsters. With that being said, Israel is losing the battle on two fronts. They're losing the information battle and they're losing the battle on the ground itself against Palestinian resistance. In reality, a ceasefire would actually benefit them as well, but their stubbornness will be their downfall. So, going to go to this video and this is a great explanation from the electronic antifada make sure i get this question. so let me share let me see gotta go to okay just want to make sure i get my timestamp. Let's go to right here. Okay, so let's go. To this, which I think we're starting to see from the Americans and the French, um, that the Israelis need, which they needed in 2006 as well. We remember in 2006, they didn't want a ceasefire in 2006. Um, and then they carried out the ground operation, got smoked, and then wanted a ceasefire. And it's so remember, ceasefires were proposed since 2006 and Israel didn't want a ceasefire. Hmm, interesting. Could have gotten one 18 years ago, but didn't happen. Let's continue. It's um, important so I think we'll to know now, John, uh, on this. This is very important because this also tells us something about you know we could look at it from the perspective of the videos which shows what's happening on the battlefield but the diplomatic uh developments also tell us what's happening on the battlefield and what i mean by that is that israel is desperate for a ceasefire but without calling it a ceasefire because they have painted themselves into this corner where they're saying they, they have all these big goals. We're going to destroy Hamas, obliterate Hamas. Gaza is going to be changed for generations. We're going to free the hostages, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they know because they said it in the beginning, stupidly, they said it and Blinken said it, that a ceasefire means Hamas won. So now they can't agree to a ceasefire that they desperately want because they, by their own definition, that's defeat for them. Their publicly stated definition, that's defeat for them. So what are they? So by that very definition, because in order to exchange hostages, you need to have a ceasefire. But since they don't want to do a, give a ceasefire, that means there, there can be no hostage exchange, which basically means Israel has shot themselves in the foot. They're losing. They're losing badly. Let's continue. What are they doing now? They keep sending these proposals through the mediators, uh, whether it's Qatar or Egypt. And the latest one is, oh, we'll give you a two-month ceasefire 
in exchange for freeing the uh, prisoners of war and will allow the senior leaders of Hamas to leave the Gaza Strip and, you know, all sorts of other things. No um, release of Palestinian prisoners from Israeli jails, though. That was also part of their... Well, approval. you know, the, the point is, right. yeah, I mean, it's all these different things. Yeah. And Hamas is saying, no, we will not accept that. Not for a month, not for two months, not for six months. It has to be a permanent ceasefire. Yeah. That's our condition. So the point I'm making is they feel that they can hold that line. So their assessment of what's happening on the battlefield, clearly their assessment of what uh, resources they have is that they can hold that line. They and just letting you know, in this video, they go at, they go and show the actual footage from Palestinian resistance. I'm gonna be honest with you; those Israeli soldiers are nincompoops. They're idiots. They are fools. The type of warfare that the Palestinian resistance is engaging in, the IDF is playing checkers. The Palestinian resistance is playing chess. Like, holy crap. So when people go, well, the IDF is winning. They only win when you're in the air, literally bombing. When they're on the ground, oh, they're screwed. They are screwed. And it's in 4K, baby. It's wild. They don't teach them on, true on-the-ground warfare. Because that's all they know how to do is bomb. He stated that very clearly a couple of weeks ago. Uh, 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 Abu Ubaidah, the spokesperson for the for the military wing of, Has of, of Hamas, the Al Qassam brigades, Abu Ubaidah, as he's known, that's the only way we know him. For, for you know, he's the man who appears with his face covered in the kafiyah, and he's sort of this legendary figure. He made that very clear. We will not accept anything less than a permanent ceasefire. Osama Hamdan, another uh, uh, senior Hamas leader in uh, Beirut, who gives these uh, daily press conferences, has been crystal clear about that. So the Israelis are the ones who constantly keep increasing their offer. First, they were saying a two-week ceasefire and, and free the prisoners. Now we're up to two months. And this is coming from the Israeli side. Yeah, they, they, yeah, there's they, Israelis don't have the ability to continue this war I indefinitely, and the Palestinians are not going to surrender. This idea that that Sinwar is surrounded by captives is ridiculous. The idea that they're going to have any kind of negotiations happening um, that involve—I mean, I don't want to predict, but I, I think one of the things that I wouldn't uh, that I would be confident predicting is that Yahya Sinwar is not going to take exile uh, as no, part of this no deal. Way. So um, these kind of talks uh, are ridiculous. And what you see is is Israel looking for a way out of a war that they're losing. And look, the Palestinians, especially the resistance, they live by the creed of "We'd rather die on our feet than live on our knees." That's basically what it is. Because they're literally protecting their land. Where their families have existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. They're not going down. What is Israel to do? we've told you that for four months that they're going to lose this war and that they're fighting against uh, Palestinians who have dedicated their entire life to this liberation struggle. And if, it, and if they didn't, ha and they weren't dedicating their life to it before, they definitely are now. Um, and this is no question that this is a national liberation struggle that nobody's going to surrender. Uh, it, it, no Palestinians wanting that. We're not even, we're not seeing anything like that. We're seeing uh, footage every single day of devastation of attacking civilians and those civilians supporting 
um, the resistance. You're not going to genocide your way uh, out of this national liberation struggle. So basically, that's what it is. And then a lot of people will go and say against uh, the Palestinians and say, but they're shooting rockets, they're shooting missiles. Here's the thing. Here, let me ask you this question. And I've asked this many times before. Does an occupied people have the right to resist occupation? Do they? Let's take a look. Because I think this is important context. Palestinians have a legal right to armed struggle. The blurb says it is time for Israel to accept this as an occupied as an occupied people, Palestinians have the right to resist in every way possible. This is from Stanley Cohen back in 2017. It says Stanley Cohen is an attorney and human rights activist who has done extensive work in the Middle East and Africa. It says, in accordance with international humanitarian law, wars of national liberation have been expressly embraced through the adoption of the additional protocol one to the Geneva Conventions in 1949 as a protected and essential right of occupied people everywhere. It says finding evolving vitality of humanitarian law for decades a General Assembly of the United Nations, once described as the collective conscience of the world, has noted that the right of peoples to self-determination, independence, and human rights Indeed, as early as 1974, Resolution 3314 of the UNGA prohibited states from any military occupation, however temporary. In relevant part, this resolution not only went on to affirm the right to self-determination, freedom, and independence of peoples forcibly deprived of that right, particularly peoples under colonial and racist regimes or other forms of alien domination, but noted the right of the occupied to struggle and to receive to seek and receive support in that effort. The term armed struggle was implied without precise definition in that resolution and many other early ones that upheld the right of indigenous persons to evict the occupier. This imprecision was to change on December 3rd, 1982. At that time, UNGA resolution 3743 remove any doubt or debate over the lawful entitlement of occupied people to resist occupying forces by any and all lawful means. The resolution reaffirmed the legitimacy of struggle of people support independence, territorial integrity, national unity, and liberation from a colonial and foreign domination and foreign occupation by all available means, including armed struggle, basically meaning the resistance that's going on in Gaza is legal. It's legal. Therefore, what the Israeli government has done is genocide, which is illegal. The resistance by Palestinians, which they have been doing, is actually legal. Because they are the original occupiers of the land. The people who are coming from Germany, Poland, Russia, United States, Canada, they are occupiers. The settlements are illegal. The settlements that are coming into West Bank are illegal. Therefore, who has a right to resist? You can't tell me to get out of my house if I've been here the entire time. You can't tell me that. We have to remember, if you're illegally occupied, you have the right to resist. Just like the indigenous people here on Turtle Island, they had the right to resist against the European colonialists who came here to steal their land. And now what happened? There was a genocide, there was a Holocaust, a Holocaust of indigenous people on this very land. Now we have them in what we call reservations.
We talked about this in the book reading of Water and the Spirit. We talked about this on Thursday night when I premiered this book. It's good. You guys should go ahead and take a look at it. But this is what colonialism does. It takes something that doesn't belong to you and it keeps it as yours. But in order to be able to do that, you have to take something that doesn't belong to you. And then when the people who it actually belongs to resist, then you have to wipe them out. That's what it is. That's what colonialism is. Ultimately, what needs to happen is for the illegal occupation to end. Apartheid needs to disappear and for the land to be given back to the Palestinian people and for them to have self-determination in their own state. What can we do? Because a lot of times we talk about the problems, what are the solutions? Keep educating ourselves and others. Now, Electronic Antifada is a great resource. And then you can pay attention to more journalists and educators like Dan Cohen, Max Blumenthal, Abby Martin, Norm Finkelstein, people who are in independent media. This is why it's important to support independent media like myself, RBN, Savvy Sabs, Hardlands Media. Indie News Network, um, Lee Camp, Danny Haifong, the like, boycotting also is helping. McDonald's is now starting to say, hey, 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 start spending money with us again. They're not too happy right now. So boycotting corporations who support the Zionist state, which is working and supporting, and then also work and support the Palestinians here who are, who are speaking out. Like for here in Orlando, you have the Orlando, you have the Florida Palestine Network, right? They're doing great work on the ground and bringing attention to the governments, the local governments, state governments about what's going on and how we need to support the Palestinians and what their right to exist. Solidarity with all people who are oppressed is how we fight and make the system work for us. Do not stop until we are all free. Thank you so very much for watching my channel and I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfon. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.